any announcements but to remind you that we are just weeks away from the International Leadership Summit. Come on, somebody. It is taking place in Dallas, Texas. There are so many incredible people on this roster that I am still learning about who's coming. I heard Kirk Franklin's going to be there. Adrian Houghton is going to be there. Israel Houghton is coming. Bishop Noel Jones, if you all are not hip, you see, I grew up in this church, and Bishop Noel Jones and Bishop T.D. Jakes used to run revivals. So you got to be old school, baby. They used to run revivals. And I was nine and 10 years old catching the overflow of the Holy Ghost. Bishop Jones and Bishop Jakes are gonna tag team again and lead us into an incredible encounter with the Lord. What I love about the International Leadership Summit is that for some of us, we recognize that we are not just leaders in our companies and organizations, but we are leaders with a kingdom assignment. And when we have a kingdom assignment, we have to understand how does this world work and function in industries that allow us to have innovation, but also how do we infuse the light of the world into those industries? And the International Leadership Summit is exactly how we get the tools to keep us on the cutting edge, but also the spirit that keeps us anchored in the midst of where God has called us. There are some of us we're called to continue building and edifying the church, and then there are are others that are called into the marketplace. They're called into the entertainment industry. And in order for them to make sure that they don't lose themselves in the pursuit of what God has called them to do, we need spaces like the International Leadership Summit where we can connect with other people who understand what it's like to be straddling that fence, but with an intense focus on making sure that the kingdom is established in literally every corner of the world. Can you just thank God for leadership that has in integrity in a world where we are desperate for leadership. If you haven't registered, use the QR code that's on the screen so that you can make sure that you are registered. We are not streaming online, so if you're thinking to yourself, I'm gonna catch it from home, I want you to take another look at your calendar to see whether or not you can make it in person with us so that we can have you at the International Leadership Summit. I find myself in Acts 1. I am in verses four through 11. I'm gonna to toggle in between the notes that I made last night and what God gave me this morning. So it may be a little reckless up here, but that's all right. Y'all gonna be patient with me because I trust what God gave me. And he gonna pull me through this message. <laughs> uh, he won't walk out on me, come on somebody. And if all else fails, I'm gonna say, you know what? We just need to worship. Worship team, come back. That's when I run out of notes. So we're going to be here for 10 minutes or an hour. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I am in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 11. I changed my title and everything. My title is A Mirror and a Model. A Mirror and a Y'all don't go, ooh, like that, because then that puts more pressure on me. <laughs> I'm in the New King James Version. We're going to start in verse 4, context. I always like to give context because I remember what it's like being in church and people just start rambling off scriptures and because I wasn't in my word real heavy, I didn't have a clue what was happening. So I'm gonna give you a little backdrop. So Jesus has been crucified, resurrected. He's walking the earth with his disciples. He walks the earth for 40 days after he has been resurrected. And he's coming to a point where he's about to make his ascension into heaven. And the disciples are all around him because they're trying to just make sure that they're soaking up so much of his presence. I mean, they spent three years of ministry with him and then he was crucified and they kind of scattered a little bit, but then he was resurrected and just reinforced their faith in Jesus. And yet it is time for Jesus to transition to the right hand of the Father. And he gives them some instructions on what they are going to do now that they will no longer be connected to him in the way that they have become accustomed. And we start in verse 4, he's giving these instructions. And my text begins, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who, said, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Holy Spirit, I need you. Without you, I can do nothing. I can say nothing that has any power to affect change, but with you, God, I honestly, truly believe that people can be drawn closer to who you know they are. And so, God, I pray that you would allow me to rest in the unknown of what this message holds, that I would rely upon your spirit and your spirit alone. And I pray, God, that the spirits in this room would be open to receive only that which comes from you, that speaks specifically to their circumstance. God, we came here to experience your glory, your presence, and I know that that is what you desire for us. So in whatever way that happens, we say yes, Lord. No fear, no nerves, no distractions, no worries, no doubt. Just your spirit and our spirit and conversation until there's transformation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let it rip. Let it rip. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I have been studying a concept called social mirroring, which when I was reading it on this psychologist's website, it didn't really make sense to me until I read it. Like I had to do a, a lot of research until I finally understood the concept. The concept of social mirroring is that when we are in conversation with someone or contact with someone, we unconsciously begin to mirror the very thing that they're doing. Um, I guess the only way I could explain this personally is like, uh, if I'm watching someone clap from across the room and they start double clapping, all of a sudden, before I can even control myself, I have a double clap spirit. I was a single clap girl and then I have a double clap spirit. Unconsciously, I begin mirroring what I saw. This also happens when we're in communication with people. Sometimes we're not even upset until they raise their voice at us. And then they raise their voice and we start raising our voice because if you wanna go, we can go. If you're trying to tussle, I'm mirroring the energy that is coming in my direction. That's why they say with gentle parenting, part of, the, part of the goal of gentle parenting is to model what you want them to mirror. So when your kids are having a meltdown and they're stressed out or they're going off, instead of mirroring their behavior, you model instead how they are to respond when they're in a stressful situation, how they are to respond when they are angry. We have to model sometimes what we want to mirror, but that takes intentionality. It's interesting though, because most of us don't even realize that we are mirroring what's happening around us. That we're mirroring our culture, atmosphere, and environment. Some of us grew up in church, but we didn't really have a relationship with God until we got older, even though we were singing and clapping and could quote scriptures, not necessarily because it was coming from the heart, but we were mirroring what was happening in our atmosphere. 
It happens in communities and cultures where you have to be tough in order to survive. You begin to learn exactly what it takes for you to survive. Mirroring sometimes is a matter of survival, emotionally, physically, professionally. When you walk into a corporate space and you don't understand the culture of the corporate space, you look around to understand this is how we are supposed to act here. There is a reason why so many black women struggled with wearing their natural hair or changing their hairstyles when going into professional environments because they recognize if I want to survive here, I have to mirror the atmosphere of where I've been called. It's not until we come to a place where we choose to be authentic that we say, there may be some things that I need to mirror, but there are other things that I need to stay fixed in so I'm not constantly changing who I am no matter what environment I'm in. Everyone knows that one person who gets in a relationship and now all of a sudden they're into all of the things that that person is into. Girl, you weren't even speaking French and now you walking around talking about parlez-vous Francois. Girl, if you... You didn't got you a Frenchman. <laughs> Honey, men out here putting masks on their face and stuff because you didn't mirrored my skincare and now you want your pores to close up. When we're in relationship with people, we begin to mirror their behaviors, which is another reason why we have to be intentional about who we are in close relationship with because you are going to model what I'm going to mirror or I'm going to mirror who you are and I have to make sure that I am okay mirroring who you are. Most of us would have never ended up in toxic relationships if we would have been willing to ask ourselves, do you really want this person to be your mirror? Or are you trying to change them to be something they aren't because you don't realize that in the moment you're trying to change them, but in reality they're making you more like them because they have become your mirror. Recognizing this unconscious notion to mirror socially is part of what I believe God was setting as a foundation for me to understand what it means to be made in his image. I have a little mirror. Brother Diller, can you hand me the mirror, please? Y'all, I'm not the illustration preacher, but here we are. Thank you. He, he watched me grow up. Thank you, Brother Dillard. Appreciate that, Brother Dillard. I'm safe for real. I'm not playing with y'all, okay? Most of us are walking through life like this, picking up whatever feelings and emotions are presented in front of us. You tell me how to speak, and I'll speak that way. We're on social media, we go through the comments, you tell me what to think, and I'll just mirror your outrage. We go home and in order to survive in our homes, we have to match the energy. I guess we're not speaking today. There, most of us are walking around and having a mirror where our face is supposed to be where we're supposed to think on our own and speak on our own. Instead, we've just become mirrors. This is why nobody really has authenticity anymore because they would rather have a, be a mirror so that they can have a sense of belonging than dare to be authentic and stand out even if I don't look like anybody else who was in the room. When scripture tells us that we're made in the image of God in Genesis 1 and 27, it says, can you put it on the screen for me? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Keep that on the screen for me. That means that when God made you, he said, I'm gonna make a mirror of who I am. Okay, God help me, okay. He's not talking about your skin color, your height. He's talking about your spirit. I want your spirit to look like my spirit. Oh God. Oh, I feel like he gonna help me today. Okay. He says, I'm gonna make you in my image on a spirit level. And then in Genesis 1:28, he tells them to do some things that you can only do if you're made in his image. Genesis 1:28 says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. 
fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. Dominion is the kind of word that can only come if you have an image that looks like God. God gave them a spirit for the mission. Oh, okay. Some of us just ask God to give us a mission. What we should be asking God is to give me a spirit for the mission. God says, I got a mission for you, but the mission only works if you have my image in your spirit. So where somebody looks at this message, this scripture, and they think to themselves, that's a lot of responsibility. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I have the spirit for it. God says, no, I gave them the spirit so that when I gave them the command, the command would be within reach. When you have a spirit that reflects God's image, when God gives you a word, you don't question the word. So maybe the problem isn't, God, can I have a word? Can you give me a purpose? What's my mission? Maybe the question instead is, God, what type of spirit do I need to have? The spirit is a spirit that looks like God's. What happens in Genesis 3, when man is made in God's image, is that the enemy comes and he... I guess he cracks the mirror. He says, did God really say? Seems like just a question, but it's really not just a question. It is a question that changes the way you see God. And if the enemy can get you to change the way you see God, then it changes not just the way you see God, but it also changes the way you see you. So now I, I, I'm trying to figure out how I can be made in the image of God, but what if God isn't really who I thought he was? What if I'm actually looking through a cracked mirror? You can take the scripture down for me. When I was studying for this message, I was asking God, how is it that we started off made in your image? But then we ended up, on the spirit level, we're made in your image, but then we ended up having to navigate the spirit of fear, the spirit of lust, the spirit of depression. Spirits, I'm not talking about fleeting emotions. Fear is an emotion until it becomes a spirit. Oh, God, help me. Okay. Oh. The serpent distorts our image of God and it opens up our spirit, it cracks our spirit, and the enemy exploits the cracks in our spirit. If you've ever had something happen in your life that made you question God, or question what God can do to you, or through you, or for you, then you did not just arrive to that place on your own. You arrived to that place as a result of the enemy distorting your image of God. And sometimes our distortion happens through family circles. Sometimes that distortion happens when we come into church and we leave with church hurt. Because we come into it thinking that we can have an open spirit. And then when we recognize that the spirit that we had that was open has actually resulted in us experiencing a wound, now we have a broken spirit. The reason why I took the time to separate the emotion of fear and the emotions of anxiety versus a, versus a spirit is because you can have an emotion without an emotion changing what you believe. When God disrupted my message this morning and none of it made sense or allowed the enemy to do it and he's going to use it for good. I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see in about 20 minutes. I had to get to a place where I said, even though I have fear and I have nerves and I have anxiety right now, I still believe that the spirit of God has sent me into this room. And so there are some moments where I have to trust the spirit because my emotions could invade my spirit. And now I have a spirit of fear instead of letting the fear just pass 
on by me. Sometimes you got to stand in the truth and the weight of the spirit, regardless of what you feel. Because if I let my feelings take over and drive me, then I'm now being governed by the, my fear. I'm governed by my emotions instead of being governed by the spirit. And I am all for therapy. I have a therapist. You do have to work through your feelings and your emotions, but you have to make sure that what was supposed to be a feeling does not become the place where you reside or you will have a spirit of shame. You'll have a spirit of lust. You'll have a spirit of pornography. There are spirits out here. And if your spirit is open, the image that you're supposed to reflect will be distorted. For God has not given you the spirit of fear. Why does Paul tell Timothy this? Because he's about to transition into a space of leadership. And Timothy is nervous and timid. And it, when what should have just been a feeling and emotion has the potential to actually become his spirit. But Paul reminds him that God did not give you the spirit of fear, but he gave you the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. And sometimes you got to rebuke those spirits that are trying to get into the cracks of the image that you have been created in. I know it's a little old school. And I know we don't always rebuke things the way that we should. But when a devil starts rolling up on you, if you give him space instead of rebuking him, you will allow the power of God to be diluted. But there is something to be said about somebody who doesn't mind saying, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. You cannot have my house. You cannot have my family. I'm going to the therapist because depression shall not be my portion. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus because you don't have to just rebuke you can start getting active with that thing too not only do I rebuke you but faith without works is dead I've got faith that when I rebuke you I put you under my feet so I'm going to start moving like the rebuking has positioned me to have my steps ordered again get out of my spirit I tell you to yell yell it get out of my spirit get out of my spirit get out of my spirit fear you gotta go get out of my spirit anxiety you gotta go get out of my spirit lust you gotta go get out of my spirit shame you gotta go get out of my spirit if I was doing it in my own power I'd have a problem but I rebuke you in the name of Jesus I serve you notice in the name of Jesus out of my spirit out of my spirit I may have been cracked but it won't be the end I may have been wounded but it won't be the end he makes all things new I wish a devil would try and get through the crack when I get finished being in the presence of God wherever there was a crack his presence is gonna feel Somebody's getting ready to get their spirit back. Somebody's getting ready to get their reflection back. Somebody's going to leave this place looking like the image of God that you were created to be. Something God in your spirit. Oh. Intruder alert, intruder alert. I got what's wrong with you. You've been trying to figure out what's wrong with you. I hear God saying there's an intruder in your spirit. It started off heartbreak, but now you don't know what your life is worth anymore. That's because what should have just been a heartbreak has become the state that you live in. Intruder, intruder, intruder. There's an intruder in your spirit. There's an intruder, that's why you can't sleep at night. There's an intruder in your spirit. That's why you don't know what to do with your life anymore. There's an intruder in your spirit. That's why suicidal ideation is taking over. There's an intruder in your spirit. Oh God. But you can't stay here. You can't stay here. You got to come into agreement 
about what your spirit is supposed to look like. Because when you know what your spirit is supposed to look like, you will not settle for anything less than what your spirit is supposed to look like. I don't want to forgive you, but I got to forgive you because I know what my spirit is supposed to look like. I'm mad at you, but I can't be mad any longer because I got to maintain what my spirit is supposed to look like. I can't be who I'm supposed to be in the earth without the rain spirit it's in your spirit it's in your spirit the power and the problem living in the same spirit So the mirror, you can't even see yourself anymore. You had these visions, you had these hopes, you wanted to break generational curses, you wanted to write a book that would help someone who had gone through what you'd been through. You wanted to introduce wholeness into your family. You wanted to take care of your body. But we can't just keep taking blow after blow after blow until it starts to affect our spirit. And you'll know that it broke your spirit when it changes what you believe. I can't believe on that level no more. Because my spirit got broken. Oh, it wasn't just a heartbreak, it changed what I believe. It wasn't just grief, it changed what I believe. It's not just a disease, it changed what I believe. I'm not just going through with the kid now. I don't believe that I'm the right parent for the job. I'm questioning myself. This thing broke my spirit. Oh, God. God, God says to Sarah, you're going to bear a child in your old age. And she laughs because I can't even believe on that level. Because being barren for so long has made it impossible for me to believe that I can produce after this much emptiness. So much so that God can send a word for you and you reject the very word God sends for you because you don't see yourself the way God sees you. Have you ever had God send a word for you that if you're honest, you don't have the spirit to match? Come on, man. If we were to be honest, and we got to be honest, because that's the only way we really experience transformation. This isn't just playing church. We got to be real about this thing. I don't know if I have the spirit for where you've called me. Because I already feel lonely. And I already feel afraid. And it looks like if I continue going down this journey, that there's only more loneliness, more betrayal, more isolation. And I don't think I'm strong enough to be who you've called me to be. But you, you keep calling me to be it anyway. I wish one of us could just give up. But he's too faithful to give up. So you got to grow up. You have to grow up. You're going to have to grow into the person who can be who God says you can be. And I don't mean growing by pretending. I mean growing by in the spirit realm. You say, God, I don't have the spirit for it. But I heard that if you dwell inside of me, that you can increase the capacity of my spirit. So God, when I say fill me up to I overflow, I mean let me overflow until I have enough capacity for the overflow. And then let me grow some more so I have capacity for that overflow. 
when Jesus calls the disciples, he says to the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Oh God. I almost called this message made for this. There's so much, I was so, I was just in my own world in this text. I thought maybe this is the text. Maybe I need to leave with this one because there was so much about this. When I hear follow me and I will make you fishers of men, for some reason I've always heard that as a question. Like he gave them an option. But it was a command. He commanded them to move in a lane that they were unfamiliar with. And when he commanded them to move into that lane, he doesn't say, follow me and you will be a fisher of men. He says, follow me and I will make you. I'm going to make you into what I'm calling you for. I'm going to make you into, you're not, you're right, you're not there. You're right, you may not have the spirit for it. You're right, you may not have the technique, you may not have the skills. But when I get finished making you, you'll be everything that you need to be. When I get finished making you, you're going to know how to cast out the devils. When I get finished making you, you're going to know how to balance the books. When I get finished, you got to make a marriage. We get married, but then you got to build a marriage. You don't just raise kids, you got to make these children. You don't just start the business, you got to make a business and guess what when God makes you into something sometimes he uses failure to make you the disciples he told them to cast out a devil it wouldn't come out he said, why couldn't it come out? He says, this time kind only comes out by fasting and praying. And it seemed like they failed, but in reality, he was making them by allowing them to fail. Is it failure? Or are they the tools that God is using to make you into who God has called you to be? And if you give up when you fail, then you'll never be made into who God has called you to be. So you got to have enough humility to stay in the making, even when it looks like you're failing to stay in the making, even when it means you got to apologize, you got to stay in the making, even when it feels like I don't know what I'm doing, I got to stay in the making because he called me to this. And I believe that he's calling me to make me, not to make me look good, not to build my ego, not to make other people jealous of me. You see, you can't have the culture of the world and the culture of the kingdom when God is making you into something because you want to be made into an ego you want to be made into an idol and God's trying to make you into a disciple and when God makes you into a disciple you got to humble yourself and you got to be willing to look a little crazy and you got to be willing to look like you don't have it all together and you got to be willing to look like your kids are crazy and how could I be saving everyone else and my kids aren't together you got to be willing to look like a fool because he uses the foolish things of the world so you can look good or you can mess around and get foolish with this thing and allow that failure to make you into a better husband into a better parent give me the spirit the spirit for this thing I'm trying to make you into something made for this and when you allow yourself to be made into what God is calling you, you don't fold easy. Cause I didn't just walk into this. I was made for this. He didn't just hand me this. He made me work for this. I had to drown for this. I had to feel like I could walk on water and find out I could, but I couldn't at the same time. I was made for this made for this family made for this ministry made for this business i was made for this i was twisted and turned and contorted and challenged and people walked away from me i had to learn how to do it on my own i was made for this thing god's not just giving you things anymore because the mirror has been broken now you have to work for that very thing god has called you to and when it's over you're going to thank him that he made you work for it but because you worked on it you know how to qualify what's the problem 
that was not a problem. I thought that was a problem too, but then I was made for this. And I realized that the weapons form, but they really don't prosper. I realized that the gossip won't take you out. I realized that they can walk away from you and you can keep on walking. How did I learn these lessons? Because I was made for this. How can I stand in a position of leadership? Because I was made for this. I want somebody crazy to say, he's making me. He's making me for this. He's making me for this. I want you to tell your fear, he's making me for this. I'm being made for this. I'm being made for this. <laughs> so, the disciples, Jesus, are being made back into the image of God. They're like the beta group of who will first experience what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. These 12 are the test group who will have the benefit of being close, closely connected with a model. Oh gosh, because they have a mirror, but the mirror's been distorted. And when your mirror has been distorted, sometimes you need more than a mirror, you need a model. Jesus is going to be their model until they're in a position where the mirror can be seen properly, their image that they've been made of, made in by God. Sometimes you need a mirror, but sometimes you need a model. And in the time that they are following Jesus, it's almost as if they have forgotten that original prompting of follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I say that because when we find them in Acts, they think that they've come to the end of the journey. There are moments where we can become so consumed I want to say this right. By serving the model that we forget that we're supposed to become a model. Oh, I wish I could say that. The first thing that he says to them suggests that eventually I'm going to put you on the front line. And when I put you on the front line, you're going to do what you see me modeling. But sometimes we can become so comfortable taking a back seat to what's happening in front of us that we forget that there was always supposed to be a transition in which we would take over. I'm going to go to my notes. Yeah. There... Standing at a threshold, I'm going to take my time. <laughs> They're at a threshold. I believe God gave me this message because we're standing at a threshold where those of us who have been modeling are having to turn over what we have modeled to people who feel ill-prepared to handle it. We're an intergenerational church, which means that there are some people here who have modeled for us what it means to serve, what it means to be in ministry. But then there's a generation coming up behind that has become so comfortable with them taking the lead. <laughs> and like, if I did it, I would do it differently. So I'm just not gonna do it at all. And so we're relying on them to continue carrying batons that have our names on them. Not realizing that they're looking for somebody who can carry out what has been placed on the inside of them. I wish I could say this better. And maybe I'm just preaching my own message. 
They're in a threshold. A threshold is when you transition. Oh, I wrote down the definition. I want to read it to you. Oh, where is it? It's not in here. That's all right. Say something saved right quick while I try and scroll through and find it. <laughs> Boom. Got it. Okay, this is what we're going to do. It is time for them to start working the glory they have been exposed to. They're at a threshold where they're going from being observers of glory, the occasional partakers, but for the most part, they've been observers, and to move into the glory that they have been exposed to. I believe that God gave me this message because there are people in this room who are moving into another realm of glory. And because you're moving into another realm of glory, you are not exactly sure how do I proceed from here. When we find them in Acts 1, they're moving into another realm of glory, but they don't know it yet, but God has prepared them. And Jesus is telling them that I'm going to give you something to help you move into this next dimension of glory. God help me to say this. I guess you could say this Jesus is about to send them out to fulfill a mission and up until this point they didn't have to worry about having cracks in their mirrors because whenever they had cracks in their mirror they had access to Jesus and Jesus could help them in the moment he could help them in the moment when this, this comes out by fasting and praying. They had direct access to Jesus. And it's a shame that we know how this story ends. Because if we could for a moment just take a second and imagine what it's like to lose your model. To not have an example anymore. To have a call but no one who's gone ahead of you. For God to put something in your spirit and then for it to look like he's left you with no one to help you fulfill the mission assigned to your life. And not only do I not have a model, now you're asking me to step into a position where I'm supposed to model something without having a model myself. Come on, generational curse breakers. What you trying to model? You, you gave me something, but I don't have anywhere to look anymore. When we read this text, they said they just looked at the sky. He was gone. How do I move from here? How do I? raise these kids? How do I build this business? How do I go for this doctorate? I don't have a model. Is there anybody in this room in uncharted territory and you don't even have a model for what it looks like to go through retirement? A model for what it looks like to be a widower? Is anybody in uncharted territory in this room? I don't have a model for the way that I want to raise my children. I don't have a model for the way that I want to handle my finances. God sometimes puts us in positions where we don't have a model. Second Corinthians. 3 and 17 is where this journey all began for me. Because when most of us start talking about going from glory to glory to glory, we get excited. But the disciples are going from glory to glory in this text, and they look stressed. Nobody tells you that when you go from glory to glory to glory that there's isolation connected to it. Nobody tells you that when you go from glory to glory to glory that sometimes you question yourself. That going from glory to glory is not the flex that people want you to think it is. Sometimes going to glory to glory means I went by myself. Sometimes going from glory to glory meant that people had to walk away from me. Sometimes going from glory to glory meant I did it feeling uncovered. Sometimes going from glory to glory meant I had a target on my back because he's asking them to do 
do something that he just got crucified for. And you're telling me that this is what promotion looks like, that I'm putting myself in a position where now I become a target, where now I can go through the very pain that you went through. Glory to glory to glory sometimes means that before you get the resurrecting power, you got to be willing to be nailed to something. So Jesus says, don't leave because you still got cracks in your spirit. Don't just take off running with this command because you still got cracks in your spirit. He says, wait for the promise of the Father. You're going to need the promise of the Father. You're going to need the Holy Ghost in order to step into this next dimension of glory. Oh God, I'm about to land the plane, but I just wanted to tell you something. I thought this was interesting because this is not the first time that Jesus has given them power and authority. We see it in Luke 9. He gave them power and authority and he sent them out and they went from home to home and I'm wondering to myself, God, if you gave them power and authority in Luke 9, why do they have to wait for the Holy Spirit in Acts 1? Because the type of power that you need for this dimension is different than the power you had for the previous dimension. I came to preach to somebody to let them know you're going from glory to glory to glory but you gotta wait because if you go to glory to glory without the power you need for this level that cracked mirror is going to crush your spirit but God is too kind to send you to the next dimension without giving you a spirit for where he is calling you to you didn't know but you came to a baptism service because somebody's about to be baptized afresh in the Holy Ghost for the dimension that God is calling them to they gotta be baptized you need a different kind of Holy Ghost for this. This is a different kind of power that you're going to need. God says, you're right that you're at the threshold. You are about to step into something you've never seen before. I came to prophesy to somebody who's been restless because they feel like they're on the edge of something. I can't even put it into language, but I know I'm on the edge of some kind of breakthrough. I know I'm not going back to who I used to be, but if I'm honest, I'm afraid of what's coming next. And I don't feel like I've got what it takes. I heard God saying you're right you don't have it but by the time the clock strikes 1047 you're going to have a fresh wave of the Holy Ghost that's going to help you go to the place that I've called you he's too gracious to send you on a mission without the spirit but I hear God saying I got the right spirit I'm just looking for the right somebody who's willing to say God I see you moving out of the way if you're going to make me into a model God give me the spirit for where you're calling me. God, give me the spirit for the mission. God, give me the spirit. I need to be baptized afresh. I need a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost. I need to stop looking at who left and start looking for what's coming. I need to stop looking at what was left behind and start looking for the promise that'll push me into the next dimension. Potter's house, I want you to know that there's a fresh wind blowing in this earth and you may have to be spiritual to understand, but I came here to let you know that if you get bogged down in the stress and the worry, in the fear and the isolation, then you will miss the moment when the wind comes. Whew. He tells these disciples, don't go nowhere. Oh, some of you are willing to go places with broken spirits because you think it makes you resilient and you think it makes you tough. But God says, I won't let you go out into the place that I've sent you unless you have access. Oh, Jesus. Mm. Oh. Put 2 Corinthians 3 and 16. Can we start with 16? On the screen for me. 17, I lied. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> and where the Spirit of the Lord is. I'm sorry. I feel like prophesying a little bit. 
God says that when you do it this time, you're going to be free. I'm going to let you do this with freedom. I'm not going to let you do this with pressure. I'm not going to let you do this oppressed. I'm not going to let you do this depressed. God says, for where I'm sending you, you're going to have the spirit of the Lord. And when you have the spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Don't put no pressure on yourself. Pressure is not liberty. Pressure is not freedom. God says, I'm going to do this thing and you'll know that I'm doing it in your spirit, with my spirit, because you're going to do it with liberty. You can't punish yourself and grow yourself at the same time. You can't let other people's expectations keep you restricted. I'm going to give it to you in my spirit. Don't miss the freedom. I think that's why he messed up my notes. Because I like to stay locked in my notes. But God says tonight, I'm going to make sure that your notes get messed up. Because I just want you to do it with a spirit of freedom. Don't be afraid when things don't work in the same formula that they used to work in. God says, if I'm going to do a new thing in your marriage, if I'm going to do a new thing in your mind, if I'm going to do a new thing in your business, you got to be willing to break out of your routine because your routine may be limiting who I want you to be and I want you to be free. Yeah. Now where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Can you give me verse 18? But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. How do I get my spirit right? I need the Holy Spirit. And I gotta be able to be free in the Holy Spirit. Because when I'm free in the Holy Spirit, I experience God's glory. And when I witness God's glory, I'm being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. You know why the enemy doesn't want you to experience the glory of God? Because if you don't experience the glory of God, you cannot experience the transformation of God. And that's why the enemy will fight you like hell to make sure that you don't get into the presence of the Lord, to make you think that those worship songs don't matter anymore, to make you feel like the sermons don't matter because the enemy knows that if I could just get in front of her face, if I could just get the glory in front of her face, if I I could just get her in front of my spirit. I taught this once that we talk about glory to glory like there's stairs and levels. And in some instances, that's certainly true. But what we see in this text is that glory to glory is when we look at the glory of God. And then we're transformed into that same image, that same glory. So no longer are we having a conversation between God and man. This is glory talking to glory. Who am I that you would be mindful of me? That you would allow your glory to reside in this broken vessel. But I'm going from glory to glory when I worship. I go from glory to glory when I lift my hands and I say, God, I need you. And I acknowledge the presence of the Lord. You think you're just doing what you've seen people do in church. It's not true. When you worship, you're being transformed into an image, an image of who God has always known you could be. From glory to glory, glory to glory to glory. And then we go up another level and it's still glory to glory to glory. Most of us mess up because we start off going from glory to glory and then we get glory and we start looking now at other people to validate us and we start looking for other people to make us feel good about ourselves. But this thing started in glory. So when I transition, when I'm standing at a threshold and I don't have a model, Jesus says, wait for the promise of the Father. 
Because the Holy Spirit is going to be your mirror. The Holy Spirit is going to show you how to model this. And if you grew up in church like me, and maybe you paid more attention than I did, that is quite plausible. I used to think having the Holy Ghost was just shouting and dancing. Oh, I got the Holy Ghost because I can shout. I got the Holy Ghost because I can dance. And I'm not saying that that's not the Holy Ghost because he will grab a hold of you. But when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, it doesn't say anything about who can shout and who can clap. It's who has the Spirit of Christ, long-suffering, kindness, patience. This is the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, I'm going to show you how to be you so that you can become a model for those who are coming up behind you. You need the Holy Spirit for this mission. I don't know what your mission is. I know what mine is. And I know that God has given me a mission that I cannot fulfill without his spirit. And it makes me uncomfortable. And it makes me feel awkward and inadequate. But when it, I get finished feeling all of those things, it makes me hungry. Because God, if you've called me to this, I got to believe that you'll give me the spirit to step into it. And there's only one way that I can access the spirit. And that's when I turn my face towards his image. I want to invite you for just 10 seconds. Does anybody feel the presence of the Lord in this place? I want to invite you to tap into that presence. Maybe you have to close your eyes to do it. I like to put my hand on my heart. I don't know why. But something happens when I acknowledge that I feel the spirit of the Lord. When I turn my attention not into what time it is or who said what or how's it going to work out or do I have what it takes or the energy or the stress or the focus but to say spirit I feel you I see you I sense you God you've given me a mission and this mission makes me feel small this mission I would prefer to not go at it alone. God, this beating this cancer, this, this is a tall order. There's some people in this room, they got real missions. Grandparents raising grandbabies. There's some people in this room got some real missions. Parents raising themselves and trying to figure out what does co-parenting look like. In custody battles, trying to not lose their faith. In legal battles, trying to hang on to their faith. There are some missions that we have to walk out in the earth that thy spirit has been cracked. And I don't know for sure that I have what it takes, but I know of a man who will meet you in the middle of those cracks and will allow his spirit to make up the difference. And we did not just come to have church. We came to have an encounter with the spirit of the Lord so that somebody can finally be free. If you're here and you can be honest enough to say that your spirit has been broken, I want you to come to this altar this is the part of the service. Unlike when we gave our tithes and our offerings, where we offer God our spirit. And what's crazy about having a broken spirit is sometimes our spirit is broken over things that happen. Jesus, I heard this, it's not what I was gonna say, but things that have happened before we were even born. 
For some of us, it feels like I was born with a broken spirit because my family had broken spirits. And it's just become normal to be comfortable having these cracked souls. It's become normal. The grief, the heartache, the abandonment, the rejection, it broke my spirit, the betrayal, the infidelity, the infertility. It broke my spirit. I want you to offer God your spirit. <laughs> One of the things that I put in my notes is that because the enemy couldn't change God's mind about you, he had to change your mind about God. 